is marking up. I think there's a slide which is going to on why we need to mask up. Okay, almost giving that away, Prof. So our fourth poll question, which of the following is correct? Few Zambians are at risk of death from COVID-19 because our population is young. B, mandated public masking decreases the spread of COVID-19. C, Zambia may be entering a rapid deceleration phase. D, reported COVID-19 deaths throughout the world capture most of the deaths. Please have a read through this as we pour on this one. Which of these is correct? Is it Zambians are at risk of death from COVID-19 because we essentially have a young population? B is mandated, compulsory, public masking. Dec uh, will it decrease the spread of COVID-19? C, Zambia may be entering a rapid deceleration phase. D, reported COVID-19 deaths throughout the world actually capture most of the death from COVID-19. We have 302 connections. We expect 302 votes. So this is the voting pattern. I will repeat the question one more time. Few Zambians are at risk of death from COVID-19 because essentially we have a young population. B, mandated public masking decreases spread of COVID-19. C, Zambia may be entering a rapid deceleration phase. D, reported COVID-19 deaths throughout the world actually capture most of the COVID-19 deaths. We will end the polling in the interest of time. And this is how we voted. This does not look like 50-50. I'm sure you'll be able to comment on A and C. There's two and five people that are not with the 96%. So, you know, we have data from um, other countries which have shown the importance of masking up. When there was a um, mandating of a face mask in the US, there was also reduction in the number of COVID-19 cases. You see before masking up and also after masking, you can see that the numbers were lower. And from day one to, to five, you can see the numbers were higher, but they kept on dropping until day 21. So you can see really that masking up does help. And this is a very, I found this very interesting. Just released the uh, last week, where 139 clients, they went to what we call a barber shop or a saloon, and there they were attended to two individuals who were both positive for COVID-19. Symptomatic. And the symptomatic, yes. And these two individuals, they had masks on them. Then also the people were also masked up. Now among the 67 of them who were tested, all of them tested negative. Now this is very encouraging. It shows that if you are responsible enough, you are masked up. Even when you are providing a service or in close contact to someone who is masked up as well, the risk of transmission is very, very limited, very, very minimal. And if you added that to physical distancing, then the risk also becomes lower. That's why masking up and physical distancing are very, very, this is the message which we need to drive. And as we talk to the people out there, let's tell them the true thing that masking up does help and also physical distancing, when you add the two of them, 
they would lead to very, very few infections. Okay, I'm sure to ask what type of masks were they wearing? These were wearing cloth masks. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a few slides, which I'll just speak to after this conclusion on what we even addressed uh, the provinces on. The important thing to note is that the COVID-19 pandemic is ongoing, it's real, there are a lot of people who question. It's sad, some people wanted to see people die for them to believe that there's COVID. Unfortunately, we are losing people, which is very sad. Yesterday, when I was doing a ward round uh, in the COVID center, I met this nurse who had been uh, talking to just before we lost uh, the Honorable MP. And is devastated. Then the amount and also the burden of these which they are seeing is also quite, quite alarming. People in there are very sick. Some of these are our colleagues. It was difficult for me to go and see these, our leaders, our parliamentarians, laboring, breathing, to see our colleagues, fellow doctors, on oxygen, our fellow nurses, friends, and we are seeing all races. We have whites in there, we have Asians, we have blacks, we have people from Kanyama, we have people from Ibex Hill. Everyone is represented in those that are very sick. And we have seen that mortality also, those people that you've just heard of, of the people who have died, we also have had high mortality among the people from the compounds. We have mortality among other races as well within Zambia. So none of us is immune. We have to really emphasize that in public, we need to have a mask. When you have any gatherings, we also need to be masked up. We need to observe the physical distancing and also this hand sanitizing. Importantly as well, let's do what is called the reverse isolation. Instead of emphasizing the isolation of those that are positive, let's isolate our elderly. I don't go to see my parents anymore because I know that I can give them COVID if I have COVID. They are isolated in their own place. If we have those who have diabetes, high blood pressure, heart diseases, kidney diseases, and control HIV as well, we need also those people to avoid being in public places or places in hospitals where they can get COVID. This message we need to drive through and through because we have now widespread infection in the community. And what we are asking for. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. We'll quickly through run the polls before we get contributions and uh, any questions for Prof and the panel of experts on this issue. On the panel, we have Dr. Agwe Mwemba, we have Dr. Musisie Buchembe, we also have Dr. Francis Mpeta joining us. So here we go. COVID-19 infection rates in Africa region are less than other who regions of the world. We can recast our votes. We have over 300 connections. We expect more than 300 votes. Okay, COVID-19 infection rates in Africa are 
below that of other who regions of the world. Is this true or false? I'll end the polling so that we can have enough time to discuss the case and get opinions from our experts. Prof, that is the voting. And of course, this is how it looks. You have uh, almost 70% thinking this is not true. And some feel that this is true. We are still less than other regions of the world, at least the whole regions. Ali, we did emphasize that we are within the same. So this statement is a false. So friends, we are not different from other regions. We are within the same ranges of other regions which have seen COVID. Okay. So when adjusting for population, Zambia has more confirmed COVID-19 cases than China. When you adjust for population, does Zambia have more COVID-19 cases than China? You can go ahead and poll. We have over 300 connections. We expect over 300 votes. When you adjust for population size, Zambia has more confirmed COVID-19 cases. When you adjust, of course, we can never really have more, but when you adjust the population case to the rest of the population ratio, what do we think? I will end the poll in the interest of time. Prof, do you want to comment on this? It's true that uh, people have gotten this right majority of people, but we have some people who are still thinking that we okay. don't adjust, we are okay, we are still below China. That's not true. We are above China when we adjust for uh, the population. Okay. Thank you. We'll go to the third poll question. Okay. Total confirmed COVID-19 deaths in Africa are less than China. True or false? Total confirmed COVID-19 deaths in Africa are less than China. Is this true or false? Are the deaths in Africa less than China? I will end the poll in the interest of time. Professor Lloyd, do you want to comment? Yeah, again, it's worrying that there's still some individuals who think that uh, China was the worst. Okay, I hope it's clear. The, the total confirmed deaths in Africa are actually more now than China, with Zambia almost approaching that. Thank you. So the fourth poll is a bit more wordy. Which of these is correct? Few Zambians are at risk of death from COVID-19 because essentially we are the population that is young. B, mandated public mask decreases spread of COVID-19. C, Zambia may be entering a period of rapid deceleration phase, meaning rapid reduction in cases. D, reported COVID-19 deaths throughout the world capture most of the COVID-19 deaths. Okay, so we have an interesting poll here, almost approaching 100 for one of the answers, which is a good thing. Concerning is that there is a small percentage that think that we may be entering a rapid drop in cases, while some people feel that our risk of death is low because we have generally a young population. 99%, 98% felt that public, mandated public masking actually reduces the spread of COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Som. I think that's a message which uh, we should spread out there. Majority of people, of course, have voted that uh, a mandated uh, public masking is the way to go. But also in addition to masking, let's observe the physical thing. If you combine the two, we reduce the chance of getting infection. 
So the two and reverse isolation, meaning we should isolate the most vulnerable in our population. So we'll ask uh, Dr. Chitanik and Dr. Zico to prepare to actually share the slides, but at this point we will get any contributions, any questions for Professor Lloyd Mlenga. He's our Director, Ministry of Health, Infectious Diseases. Do we have any questions? Dr. Stanika, please hold on the share. We have the QR code. Please, for those that have their devices, scan the QR code. You have access to this slide deck at the end. Remember to scan now and at the end. Do we have any questions, any hands up? As we are waiting for questions, let me just say that each hospital and each province, you need to have a designated hospital for COVID-19, aligning some for suspects and some for confirmed cases. And map up also and also bring up to place the intensive care. Form up the hospital incident management groups and review your stage capacity on a weekly basis. Coordinate also with the private hospitals. We are seeing a lot of infections in the private sector. And come up with a communication strategy and train and retrain the healthcare workers. Right now is time to emphasize now on clinical management, critical care management, and also infection prevention. Okay, thank you very much. I'll allow Dr. Kabamba to go ahead with his question. May we please unmute Dr. Kabamba? Uh, thank you so much, uh, the chairperson. Uh, good afternoon, Professor. Um, good afternoon, Doctor. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, this um, edifying um, presentation. Um, my question is this. I just wanted to find out, from the beginning of this pandemic, remember that, I mean, in March, we recorded, I mean, a number of cases, and uh, really in terms of mortality, it wasn't that bad, maybe because at that particular time, the weather was... Um, was generous, and now that we've gone into the court season, maybe that's the reason why we are recording this, I mean, the, the increase in terms of morbidity and even mortality. But I just want to find out whether uh, right at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, this other side, whether we managed to do uh, some genetic mapping of uh, the virus that we are at that particular time, and then maybe uh, doing another one right now and seeing whether we are dealing with the same uh, the same virus or the virus has undergone some mutation. Thank you. So we did uh, a full genome sequencing for the first uh, two or three cases. And as we speak as well, we have, uh, there's one which is being worked on to compare, but also we need to get a number of samples from different areas as well. So yes, we are going to compare those that we got in early March and also now comparing to those which we have in July. We have, of course, the sequencing done for the... Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was a great question. We'll allow Dr. Kevin Zimba, another pediatrician, to go. Dr. Zimba, please go ahead. Up there. Up there. Oh. Hello? Hi, Dr. Zimba. Please go ahead. Okay, I want to find out. So, as we are saying, the BIDs have increased. Have we statistically looked at the difference, if there's any difference between the number of BIDs we're seeing, like week for week, compared to 2018, 2019? and 2020 so far for a particular city, for instance, like Usaka. Since Usaka is actually easy to count the number of BIDs, since all the BIDs end up at UTH. So okay, have we looked at that to see whether there's a statistical difference in the number of BIDs we're seeing now that we have COVID and last year or this year? Thank you. Very good. Uh, very tricky as well to answer. So initially there was a report which was given that we have seen a 50% a, 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 a increase in the BIDs. Apparently that was not, was 40 reporting 
Um, there were two outliers, rural health centers, which reported, uh, one reported 5,000 BIDs uh, over three months, and another one reported close to 3,000, uh, when in fact what they had, the BIDs were two or four. So that led to people classifying as though we are having high mortality. For now, when you compare, the data is being looked at, when you compare uh, last year, not week by week, but month by month, the mortality difference has not been observed uh, to, to be there. But we're still really looking at data, especially that now this is when we have at this stage. So we have to closely look at uh, June, July, the BID data and compare it to the previous years. Thank you very much. I can see Mr. or Dr. Dixon Matatula. He was very, says he's very scared. I believe he was asking a question about under fives. Mr. Dixon, would you like to share your question? Please unmute Dixon. Dixon. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do not be okay, th afraid. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Actually, my worry was regarding the question I raised, and I think it was partly answered regarding the possibility of the virus having mutated. I think I got some response from Dr. Peter. So the question regarding the under five was, uh, I think the data that was displayed showed that uh, we have low infection rates in the infants and the under fives compared to those above 60, and the assumption is that the under fives and infants, just like the elderly, they are, they, they are not that immunocompetent. So what would account for the low infections in the, in the young ones? Would, would there, is there, could there be possibility of uh, some of the vaccines we give them for immunization, maybe conferring some sort of immunity, or what could be the explanation so far? Thank you. Okay, I think I've seen Dr. Chung. Do you want to take up that question? I think he was looking at the data that's for the under fives. Is there a possibility of cross protection from our other antiviral immunization? Dr. Chungu, any comment? Because uh, I think the statement is uh, we believe uh, under fives are as immunocompromised as our aged. How come we are seeing low infection and mo low mortality in that population? Of course, under fives can further be segregated to those that are under one year and those that are between one and five years. I know the epidemiology is different. Dr. Chalwe Chungu. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Voloshi. Thank you, Prof, for that question. So, so far, there's been no concrete data as to why the under five population is protected, aside the theory about the AC2 in, um, receptors, which are underdeveloped in the pediatric population. But then we do know that there have been reports of um, post-COVID infections where we got the, um, the Kawasaki-like illness and uh, uh, AAP is actually releasing new guidelines on the management of that. But in terms of absolute numbers, uh, the, Dixon is right. Yes, the numbers have been less. But the theory is there hasn't been anything about cross protection from vaccines. Initially, there was a theory about BCG being protective, which was protecting the African population. But I think with what we've been yeah, seeing yeah. now, that's not the case. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe others would like to weigh in as well. Dr. Kalamba. Dr. Kabamba. Okay, I think we lost him, but I think that's uh, clear. There is still a lot of science to be done in the pediatric population. But I believe in those that are under one, they are also at risk, under one year, they are also at risk of severe infection. So
the post, the, thank you for uh, typing that you lost audio, sorry about that. So Professor was saying that we have just received information to answer Dr. Zimba's question that the trends are that there is no actual increase in the BIDs we are seeing right now as, comp as compared to other years. But we have had some tests positive. Dr. Zimba, with that answer now, do you want to say anything? Dr. Zimba? Anyway, essentially, we haven't seen an increase in the number of BIDs, but we have reported COVID-19, at least positive SARS-CoV on these uh, uh, individuals. We'll allow Monze to please go ahead with the um, contribution. <coughs> yes, good afternoon, Doc. Good afternoon, good Professor. Afternoon. Uh, yes, our concern is on the, the, the dates that we have. Looking at the, 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 the presentation that us, there are those that are associated with COVID-19 and those that are COVID-19. Then we asking, is there any uh, data that gives us those that have died from COVID-19 and those that have um, uh, as, associated with COVID-19 deaths in terms of numbers? Thank you. Have died from COVID 19 and those that have died from COVID 19 associated. Yes, I think that slide was shared uh, earlier. I believe the numbers were. So given. we have 28. We have 28 yeah. which are COVID deaths. 28 where I believe that uh, it was COVID which led to the death. Then the others are the ones which we. Uh, are not COVID related and they are the COVID associated deaths. And again, even for those with uh, where I believe it's COVID, then some, in fact, more than 90% more than of them have had comorbidities, although it's not that, com that particular comorbidity which had led to death. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have David Singini, please go ahead. We'll soon be moving to our case, so we'll just allow a question from David, from LPHO and uh, Dallas. David, please go ahead. We can't hear you. May you please speak up? Uh, slightly, but again, okay. try again. Yes. All right. So I was asking to say, looking at the, the the number of cases that we have seen, the rise in the number of cases, as well as the the, the projections that were done by different authorities, suggesting that we haven't reached the peak. So, from the perspective of Ministry of Health, what measures have been put in place to improve the the testing around the country? Because of late, from a clinician's perspective, we've noticed that the turnaround time is still quite long. And for some, for some, for some patients, they've had to wait a little more than a week or more than that to get to their results. So that's the first one. And then the second one is that from previous presentations, we learned that in Zambia, hydroxychloroquine was being used as a trial for people with severe cases. So is there any significant data that can suggest or, or disprove that it improves the prognosis in severe patients? Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, David. Dr. Shibamba, do you want to take the question on the turnaround time for the SARS-CoV-2 results? Uh. Dr. Shibemba. Hello, can you hear yes. me? We can hear you. Yeah, uh, so the turnaround time uh, depends on a lot of factors. Number one, 
the actual test, if you are talking of the actual test testing on the real time PCR, you are talking of uh, minimum 48 hours. So, right now, because we don't have enough reagents and we have a backlog in uh, both labs that are testing uh, in mass, that is UTH virology and TDRC, that's why the turnaround time is, is a bit longer. Just about four weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, the turnaround time I think was much reasonable because we had reagents on all the platforms, the gene expert, the COBA 6800 and the real-time PCR. Right now what we have is just the real-time PCR and we just received some reagents a week ago on the COBA 6800. So we are trying to clear that backlog and then maybe we will see that the turnaround time uh, is shortened. Um, the issue with reagents is global. As you know, you have to order from the same manufacturers all the countries. So it's like a queue and it's first come, first serve. Sometimes the power of countries actually take precedence. So we really have no control over that. But in terms of testing capacity, we have the testing capacity. Uh, as I've already mentioned, we've got three platforms that we are testing COVID on. Apart from that, there is also an addition coming on, the Ologic Panther machine, which is in uh, Northwestern province, Western province, Wapula province, no, uh, Northern province, and Central province. And these are the provinces that are currently not testing because we don't have reagents for the gene expert, which they have, and they are ready to start testing on the gene expert. Thank you very much, Dr. Shibemba. Thank you so much. So, Professor Lloyd, there is a question here on hydroxychloroquine. What, have, what results have we seen, if at all we've used it in Zambia? Let me just compliment uh, what Dr. Shibemba mentioned, we are also changing the, going to change the testing strategy, where our priority would be those patients who are in the hospitals, the healthcare workers, and the contacts who are, who are symptomatic. Right now, we have a lot of tests being done for those patients who are just want to come and do a swab for the sake of doing a swab. And uh, this is now limiting the access for those whom we need uh, to make a decision because they are sick. So that strategy will be rolled out likely in the next one to two weeks. Then over chloroquine, a lot of things have come up over chloroquine. Right now, the data is not uh, reassuring that hydroxychloroquine is um, effective in the very sick, but also even those with uh, mild symptoms. So we are very careful in its use uh, as you have seen, it's not even in the guidelines. It's something which um, an individual physician does decide. Uh, of course, it's been used. We haven't had any adverse effects from it. Uh, but in terms of those who have severe disease, we are now stockpiling and using dexamethasone. Some of them, of course, with uh, uh, heparin. Uh, then we also are just uh, trying to source remdesivir. We are likely going to get remdesivir by mid-August to end of August. So those are our key elements which we are stockpiling for, for treatment. Thank you, Professor. Lusaka uh, Provincial Health Office. Good afternoon, Dr. Sombo. Uh, this is Dr. Good afternoon, Martin. Dr. Mwape. Thank you, Prof, for that presentation. I think my, my question has been partly answered. I was going to ask you on the testing strategy now that you adequately answered. I'll just add an a component of the question, which was on the BIDs. Why are we not prioritizing the testing for BIDs and hospital deaths? Because we were also waiting for a long time for the results to come. Thank you. Why aren't BIDs being prioritized? I guess the essence would be for contact tracing, isn't it? Because um, uh, they are already demised. Why are we not prioritizing them? Maybe after inpatients, BIDs. 
I think is the question. Thanks, Dr. Mape. Thank you, Doc. Although I think what we would put in the order BIDs would be maybe third, the inpatients, then the symptomatics to the contacts, and uh, the BIDs. And as you know, the yield from the BIDs also would be lower. So again, you have to look at the, the logistics uh, and also the supplies which we have. Okay. Lucy, I acknowledge you uh, have your hand up. Yeah, for hello, Dr. Sovo. Yes, Dr. Chibemba. Just to add on what Professor has said. Yes. Uh, you know, it's difficult on the testing side if we say prioritizing. It's very, very difficult because you are going to find that BID is a priority. Inpatients are priorities. VVIPs are priorities. Workers are priorities. So what is cardinal is to have a lot of testing sites so that you can designate that this site is just for VVIP, this site is for BIDs, not one lab doing all these testing from different uh, sector. It's very, very difficult. And actually what we have noticed is that it's actually disrupting our normal testing. And that's why we have seen very few numbers being tested because you can have samples come into the lab, you sort them out. And sorting out the COVID-19 samples is such a mess because remember you have to have PPEs and once you are in those PPEs and you are in that room, you are not supposed to come out. So now during that period, someone comes and say, oh, I've got BID samples, this is priority. So you disrupt that and it's time. We are looking at sorting out is, is to have multiple testing sites, which we can have and which we have actually, but now it's just the lack of reagents that is killing us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shibemba. I think that is very much needed information. Dr. Chitanika, please go ahead and share your slide deck for the, the case. As we do that, there are a few questions in the chat. They are asking, what is the case fatality rate for the COVID we are seeing in Zambia? Uh, of course, it's mixed, as I said, 0.6%, uh, where we say it's COVID. Okay. Then the overall infection uh, case fatality, that is the 4%. Dr. Chitanika, please share your slides. Uh, Somebody is asking about food testing, which I believe we are doing already. Yes, yeah, so when we have a number of samples, we do food testing where you batch samples together. Then if you have in one batch where you have to sort out individually uh, uh, the tests, that helps in clearing yes. um, the low, especially the, the, the high volumes which we have. So Zambia has adapted, adopted that as well. So Dr. Stanika, please go ahead with your case. Um, hello, are people able to get me? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay, um, I'm trying to see. Oh, I, I don't know who's, who's, I can tell the person to move the slides because I'm not the one sharing. sharing. We are sharing, next slide, we are sharing. Okay, all right, so, oh my goodness. Okay, okay, good. So we are presenting a case that we currently have admitted here at the COVID center. Um, so it's a male, 56 year, years old. So he presented to UTH on the 8th of July. The, um, he was complaining of fever, diarrhea, and fatigue. Um, there was a background history of a travel to Muchinga province for work, and the symptoms began the day he came back. He had watery diarrhea, and this diarrhea was watery. It was non-bloody, non-mucoid, and ton, it was only an episode a day. He did not have any respiratory symptoms. Uh, when he was seen at OPD, it was found that he was hypotensive and uh, 
this is what led to, to his admission. Uh, he developed uh, respiratory symptoms three days into admission and uh, rapidly worsened. Of note is that his past medical history is significant for both diabetes and metformin, for which he has been taking metformin, uh, diabetes and hypertension, sorry, for which he's been taking metformin, uh, glimepiride, and amlodipine. On uh, physical examination, when he came, he was hypotensive. The blood pressure was 89.57. Uh, the temperature was uh, 35.8. The pulse was 72. He was uh, fully conscious and uh, had uh, an unremarkable systemic exam. So the admitting doctor, um, uh, we put a list of differentials, uh, malaria, I think on the background of travel, enteric fever and uh, COVID-19 with GI symptoms. We can move to the next slide. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Hello. Is this slide okay, the one with the lab? Yes, yes, uh, I can't see the slide. Okay, yes, yes, uh-huh. Okay, <laughs> okay, yes, thank you. So these are, these are some of the investigations that uh, we, we did. So in the first line, when he came, uh, he was swabbed for COVID. Uh, the sample was collected uh, on the 7th. It came out positive on the 11th. Uh, the blood count was collected. There was no growth. On the white cell, on the full blood count, what was of note was that this patient had a mild anemia and a lymphopenia. His MPS was negative. Uh, this two microscopy was, was non remarkable. So he was put on safe triaxone. That's on admission. He was given some saline to up his BP. On the 11th, when his uh, COVID results came out positive, he was transferred to our facility here at Levy. By then, he had already developed uh, respiratory symptoms. Um, we started him on dexamethasone. Uh -huh. This is his x-ray. This was done from UTH. So you note that um, there, okay, we can move to the next slide. So this is x-ray, this was done from UTH. So of note is that he had um, ground glass opacities and yes, the x-ray, x-ray. Can you see the x-ray, Dr. Stanikai? Yes, I saw the x-ray, but uh, it quickly moved. Yes, okay, I can see the x-ray. Okay. okay. So he had, uh, yes, he had uh, ground glass opacities in both, uh, lower lobes and uh, yeah. Dr. Zico. Okay, I guess we'll go into the question. Essentially, you can see infiltrates in the X-ray and they are abnormal. You can see that there's affection of the lower and the mid zones of the on the lung in this sorry. patient. Yeah. Okay, we can go to the question. The question. So the first question is what extra pulmonary manifestation of um, COVID-19 can aid in diagnosis? And the second question is, can radiological features be used to diagnose COVID-19 in the absence of lab results? Thank you so much for taking time off your busy schedule to present this case. Essentially, we have, we have a 56-year-old male, non-diabetic and hypertensive, who 
had presented with uh, fever and actually diarrhea. Initially, he had no respiratory symptoms. However, they went ahead and tested this patient. Remember, he came in hypotensive and he required admission. As you may be aware, in Zambia, under active surveillance, everybody that's admitted to the medical wards get a swab. They get swabbed, and that's how they found that he was positive. The result came five days later. He was actually transferred to the um, isolation center where Dr. Chitanika came in contact with him. Uh, of note is that he had no growth on blood culture and had a mild anemia. His chest x-ray showed opacities, which is infiltrating the lower and mid zones. Um, the question from the team is, what important extra pulmonary manifestation of COVID-19 can aid in diagnosis? And the second question is, can radiological features be used to diagnose COVID-19 in the absence of lab results? So is it enough to have a radiological picture? Remember, radiology is broad. We should not confine ourselves to chest x-rays. You may want to think about CT scans and ultrasounds. I believe we have uh, Dr. Mwemba. Do you want to give a go at the first question? Dr. Mwemba? Yes, Dr. Foloch. Sorry, I was in, I'm in another meeting. Uh, but oh, okay. I can answer. Now you're in this one. <laughs> yeah, now I'm in this yes. one, so I can answer. Mm -hmm. I think, what? given obviously the scenario that we have on the ground at the moment, um, the results are coming late and we have issues of um, not, not having enough um, um, test kits. So I think that um, a diagnosis can be, uh, can be, can be made. Um, and I think Prof is going to answer over that because I think it's something that we've discussed that probably we need to give a guide uh, on how um, that diagnosis can be, can be made so that the patient can start receiving the necessary um, interventions that need to be given. Okay, so I think that's important. So I think what uh, Dr. Stenka also wants to know, what things should raise your flag aside the usual pneumonia, shortness of breath, cough, to say, wow, this may actually be a, a COVID. I know with community spread, that's like the highest epidemiological level of virus spread they can come in anyway. His question is, what other things, aside chest pains, aside cough, aside shortness okay. of breath? Okay, yes. okay. So, um, so I think that COVID can present in, um, in different ways. I think that uh, some of these, we've already even experienced it um, um, in Zambia. Um, one of it is that it can actually onset your hypertension. Uh, so severe hypertension from nowhere escalating to say very severe hypertension could be actually COVID presentation. I think previously we have had sessions on cardiac, um, uh, cardiac failure. Um, so you can have a myocardial infarction. You can have a cardiomyopathy. You can have myocarditis. Um, and you can have um, um, heart failure or new onset heart failure. All those can be um, COVID presentations. You can have um, new onset diabetes probably uh, because of, because of um, COVID. And AKI itself is uh, COVID related. And apart, apart from that, you can have issues of coagulation. Um, so new stroke uh, in a patient who's hypertensive uh, could, be, could, be, could be COVID. So you can see that uh, there are a range of things that COVID can give. Uh, pulmonary embolism itself can be COVID related. Uh, and so some of these are just uh, some of the things that you can have. Hepatitis itself. So we see ASTs, AOTs going very high and patient has, has, has actually hepatitis due to, due to COVID. So COVID has so many other extra pulmonary uh, presentations that we need to look for. Thank Over. you. So, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Mwemba. I know the other expert we have is uh, Dr. Massina, who's an emergency physician. He's a consultant. Uh, do you want to give a go at this? Any more things we should be looking for? I know we've had patients present with a lot of smell, a lot of taste. What other array of things can people come with that can aid us in thinking, oh, this may be COVID, even if somebody does not have a cough 
they are not short of breath. Like our patient here, they had diarrhea, just diarrhea, no respiratory symptoms. Dr. Masina and Dr. Mpeta will go after you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Foloshi. Uh, it's actually quite uh, amazing uh, to find that there are a lot of uh, extra pulmonary manifestation of uh, COVID-19. And I think most of the extra pulmonary have been uh, alluded to by uh, Dr. Mwemba. But of note is that there are also other uh, general and non-specific features like just general malaise, uh, issues like unspecific uh, uh, dermatological presentation of uh, COVID-19. There is a particular lash that uh, these uh, COVID-19 patients have been presenting with. So there are, there are a lot of other extra pulmonary manifestation. Things like hemorrhagic strokes that uh, Dr. Mwemba has alluded to. And, both, and what we should know is that both hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes are actually part of the presentation. And, uh, and in a few weeks, I think we've seen patients with presenting with uh, uh, transient ischemic attacks. So they'll come in with uh, neurological deficits, which is improving gradually as the time goes by. That should also uh, raise flags to say this patient might be COVID because, uh, because of the thromboembolic uh, phenomena that they're having. So they, quite, they, they can have multiple uh, thrombi mm. in the brain and then presenting as TIAs. So I think we should, uh, we should look out for that. I've seen, I think, a couple of patients in the last week or so that have presented actually 14, day, 14 days after uh, the COVID test with uh, transit ischemic attacks. So we should be aware of that. Thank you. It's interesting, thank you, Dr. Massina, that you talk about TIAs, because I know I received a call where somebody said their father had a TIA for just a couple of hours, but they are fine now. So those are people we need to think of in the terms of the COVID test. Uh, Dr. Mpeta, are you still around? Do you have any comments, especially in the context that we are launching the second leg of our COVID-19 pandemic series? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Foloshi, and pretty much <clears throat> thank you very much to Dr. Mwemba and uh, Dr. Masina, the previous speakers. So basically, uh, what I would just like to add is, uh, you know, the concept of what we are terming the rapid identification of cases in a clinical setting. And, and I understand that most of us now, like Professor said, we have to really place a lot of emphasis on case management. So uh, we have to categorize, and basically I'll talk about the same things that um, Dr. Masina and Dr. Mwemba have, have spoken about. It's basically just characterizing you know, patients who come to the hospital based on clinical symptoms, clinical signs, and the diagnostic tests that are available. So the clinical signs and symptoms basically will be known to everyone. We've got respiratory and non-respiratory symptoms. Now, something that should really, really ensure that it triggers a high index of suspicion outside the respiratory you know, components are fatigue. So extreme fatigue and feeling, feeling of not being well should be one of those things that should trigger a high index of suspicion and a test for SARS-CoV-2. Then, like we have said, loss of smell and taste are highly uh, sensitive for COVID. And then things like headache, which doesn't seem to go away with, you know, um, with passing time. You take painkillers, 30 minutes later, the headache comes back. Then we also have unexplained diarrhea and sometimes abdominal discomfort, you know, where you cannot trace why you're having this you know, stomach upsets, uh, not food related or not any other condition that you might have or associated with you taking any drugs. So this basically should um, also trigger, you know, the suspicion of, um, of COVID. And then um, confusion, new onset confusion. Uh, somebody who comes with new onsets of confusion with or without respiratory symptoms should be able to trigger you know, that index. Then, of course, the clinical signs that, um, you know, Dr. Mancina and Dr. Mwemba spoke about, new, on, new onset of stroke in a patient with or without risk factors, especially this is being seen in the young people. Uh, there's a case series that we are doing right now looking at, you know, the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 among young people below the age of 40 who presented with a stroke. New MI, uh, unexplained, you know, low saturations of oxygen, and explain sepsis, especially particularly in children, and explain venous thromboembolism, 
So these are some of the clinical signs that you could look at. And then the diagnostic, of course, uh, w w the question really is asking about non-laboratory best. So non-laboratory best is use of chest x-ray. So if you do a chest x-ray on day one, on the day of presentation, repeat that x-ray on day three. If you haven't gotten any result, uh, laboratory results for SARS-CoV-2, if you compare, you see that they are worsening infiltrates, which are bilateral and mostly starting from the bottom going up or starting from you know outside coming inside. It should be able to tell you that this is almost hundred percent, almost hundred percent, you know, COVID. Uh, um, and then you can also use other diagnostic, uh, you know, images such as CT scan, which I know that some of the provincial hospitals have and the private sector. But something of use uh, of, of note is the use of an ultrasound, pulmonary ultrasound. If you have got the competences of trying to see infiltrates based on ultrasound, please use it. And these are readily available in big hospitals in the emergency care settings. So this is very, very important in our quest to identify um, COVID rapidly. Thanks. Thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Ampets. I believe you've even gone into the second one where we say, can we use radiological features to make a diagnosis of COVID-19? I think he has said that, yes, pay attention, let's repeat x-rays at least every three days if you see worsening infiltrates. But I know that there are certain guidelines, like the German guidelines that say, if you see ground glass, then that's probably a, a COVID. You can have confidence that that's a COVID-19 infection. Of course, the gold standard remains the, the PC. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Massina, I know you are in the center. What type of patterns are you seeing? I know most of our patients, they have access to chest x-rays. Do you also want to comment on what Dr. Mpeta uh, talked about? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Foloshi. So we, we've actually seen a lot of uh, ground uh, in, in terms of the x-rays. Uh, I think maybe CT scan, I'll, I'll put it later. Let me just allude to x-rays. So in terms of the x-rays, I think what is, what is important is the bilateral uh, effect. So you're going to find that COVID will have a bilateral effect on the, on the chest x-rays. So there will be opacifications on both sides. It, kind of a, a similar picture to uh, congested cardiac failure with pulmonary edema, but the only difference is that with pulmonary edema, the bilateral infiltrates will be in the uh, pelihyla uh, areas, zones, as compared with which goes for the peripheral, uh, peripheral lower lobes. And if you look at the TB x-rays, most of the x-rays will be affecting the upper lobe of the uh, whereas it is going to spare the upper lobes, but it will affect the lower lobes and the middle zones. And most of those zones that are affected again will be in the periphery. Uh, and, that, and that's what we've seen in most of the x-rays uh, of the patients that we, we've had in the center. If you look at the x-rays that were shared uh, today, you're going to find that it's a, it has the same picture. It's, a, it's, in, it's a involving the bilateral uh, lung fields, and it's also involving the lower zones and in the peripheral zones. And then when you come to CT scans, I think Dr. Chisha has a way of explaining this very well, but I'll try to explain it in my own language. But what he's been explaining is that you find that there will be a ground grass appearance, and this ground grass uh, appearance will be affecting the posterior zones of, 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 the, of the lungs as, as compared to, to the, to the perihyla nodes uh, as well. And of note, we've seen that most of the patients with COVID are not presenting with perihyla fullness as compared to TB. TB usually presents with perihyla fullness and affecting the upper lobes. But COVID, it's more in the peripheral and more of the peripheral more of the posterior lung, lung zones that have been affected. And then when you go to ultrasound, so in terms of the ultrasound, you need to differentiate the pulmonary edema secondary to ultrasound or the ARDS kind secondary to, uh, to, power, to cardiac manifestation. In COVID patients, you're going to find that they're not going to show the, the classical uh, beeline presentation in terms of the pulmonary edema or the ARDS. Uh, in COVID patients, they will actually present with airline infiltration where when you look if people know how to use the ultrasound you're going to find that the, the, this uh, ARDS picture is not secondary to fluid in the lung it's just a consolidation and the fibrosis 
that is happening that is happening in the land. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Masina, Dr. Agwe, Dr. Mpeta, and uh, Dr. Msisi. We hope to prepare for this section for this session, especially to you, Davis. Dr. Chitanika, have your questions been adequately answered? Yes, they have. They have. Okay. No, thank you so much. But the good news is that this series will go on for most of the whole month of July and most of August. There will be more um, topics like this. I think Dr. Mpeta will be leading trainings, virtual training, starting next week. Do you want to comment on that, Dr. Mpeta? Okay. I think we've lost Yes, him. Dr. Faloshi. Yes, do you want to comment on the upcoming virtual COVID-19 training? Yeah, um, basically, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, so we, we have set up uh, quite a number of topics, especially as evidence is emerging with regards to, you know, uh, COVID-19. So um, uh, we would really want consistency in terms of attendance for this because definitely you will get the whole picture if you attend the whole series. So we're going to have, you know, different topics starting from epidemiology, looking at transmission mission and diagnosis to therapeutics and management of critically ill, including, um, you know, sections such as how to assess your facility for readiness in terms of oxygen therapy and how to also, you know, search the capacity in terms of uh, critical care. So um, uh, these trainings basically uh, will be the same we've been doing the case management trainings, but it will be online based. And we hope that with due to, in due course, we will also be you know, posting videos in trying to just illustrate some of the demonstrable skills that will be needed. So um, I'm excited and um, please we would encourage all the participants and all the people on the network to ensure that um, they prepare for this and make sure that they attend. They will also come with CPD points for those who are you know, requiring registration with, um, um, with the, the regulatory authorities. So yeah, this is basically what we intend to do, uh, Dr. Thank Fowler. you so yes. much, uh, Dr. Mpeta. Uh, in view of this and the uh, current acceleration phase, this slot will be given up and will be dedicated to COVID-19. However, we acknowledge that services for other diseases must go on. So we will have lunchtime sessions to deal with our HIV TB topics, then run into this one on Mondays. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, Professor Lloyd has had to leave to go to the COVID center. He wishes you all the best and we'll see you next week as we start our series. Thank you and it's a wrap.